He is risen. He is risen Amen. I love that. <laughs> it's such a wonderful thing to say. Not only to say, but to affirm uh, with truth that He is risen. That He isn't in the grave anymore. But three days after He was laid to rest, He came out of the grave alive. And uh, then the, the new world began in Jesus. And so it's wonderful to be here with you to, to celebrate what he has achieved, uh, not for himself, but for us and for uh, everyone who has come after him, who had put their faith in him. So indeed, it's a wonderful day to be here. Uh, for us to be here and to know that uh, the uh, church of Jesus Christ around the world is also the same, celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody's voice, maybe at a different time, maybe the same time, is offering up their praise to Him. And so one united chorus worldwide is celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. Well, it's my privilege to uh, welcome you, and it's a rare event that we have an occasion to uh, have a Resurrection Sunday. On the same day, we're going to have the Lord's Supper as well. So it's going to be a privilege for us to interface with him and for him to meet with us in these elements. I'm going to have you stand now and take out your bulletin as we prepare to read responsibly from the 121st Psalm as we begin our service. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out, your coming in, from this time forth and forevermore. Lord, we are reminded from these words that the notion of forevermore reached well beyond what even the psalmist then fully understood. And we who have been illuminated by the new covenant in Jesus Christ still can only begin to imagine what that forevermore shall be. And today we shall contemplate what some of that shall be as we contemplate the resurrection. Lord, we thank you that we together with Christians all around the world, are joining our voices and hearts and minds in one accord to bring honor and glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, and their accomplishment in our salvation. We thank you that we have been called out of darkness to light. We thank you that we have been endowed with the Spirit of God. We thank you that you have made us new creatures in Christ. We thank you that there is in us a real living, uh, inextinguishable reality, a seed, uh, a sharing in uh, the resurrected life of Jesus in us, uh, which we know to be true, which daily is being renewed even though our bodies are uh, slowly slowing down. And so we look to you today, we're grateful to you today for what you have achieved and are continuing to do in our midst even as we recite the prayer which you have given your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise, we say the word Hosanna. Hosanna comes from the Hebrew word meaning save us or save us we pray. And this is a hymn of expre that expresses adoration, praise, and joy. Join me as we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. 
Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sing. Through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem rang. To Jesus who had blessed them, those folded to his breast. The children sang their praises, the simplest and the best. From Olivet they followed, mid an exultant crowd, the victor palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud. The Lord of men and angels rode on in lowly state, nor scorned that little children should on. Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing. For Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven our King. Oh, may we ever praise Him with heart and life and voice, and in His blissful presence. together uh, praise our triune God as we sing the doxology. morning. As I mentioned this morning, our uh, portion of our worship this morning is renewal and repentance, or repentance and renewal. Um, it's from Colossians, which many of you remember we were in the middle of a year ago in an adult fellowship class going through the book of Colossians when um, our lives were changed. So let's hear God's word today through this book and through the Apostle Paul. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. The next portion is from the Valley of Vision. And we've read it here before. To be honest, I, I struggle with this in Psalm 51 with weeping every time I read it. I'll tr I almost broke up this morning, and I will try to uh, do a little better. Hear with me this Puritan, beautiful Puritan prayer. O God of grace, you have imputed my sin to my substitute and have imputed his righteousness to my soul clothing me with a bridegroom's robe, decking me with jewels of holiness. But in my Christian walk, I am still in rags. My best prayers are stained with sin. My penitent tears are so much impurity. My confessions of wrong are so many intensification of sin. My receiving the Spirit is mixed with selfishness. I need to repent of my repentance. I need my tears to be washed. 
I have no robe to bring to cover my sins, no loom to weave my own righteousness. I am always standing fully clothed in filthy garments and by grace am always receiving change of raiment. For you always justify the ungodly. I am always going into the far country and always returning home as a prodigal. Always saying, Father, forgive me. And you are always bringing out for me the best robe. Every morning, let me wear it. Every evening return in it. Go out to do the day's work in it. Be married in it. Be wound in death in it. Stand before the great white throne in it. Enter heaven in it, shining as the sun. Oh, grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, the exceeding wonder of grace. Amen. Please join me as I lead us in prayer. Father, we are thankful for this uh, middle portion of our worship service where we have the occasion to take a few minutes and interface uh, with you to acknowledge that we in ourselves have no basis for coming to you and calling, even calling upon your name, uh, except it for Jesus Christ. And the last verse, the last sentence from Colossians uh, summarizes what our lives are in him. For when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And there it is, uh, the final call of all that you sought to achieve, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for us. And with those words and with the image of being brought uh, with him in glory, we shall be home. Lord, thank you that we are brought home, even in principle, Uh, in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today we thank you for the privilege of focusing upon him, looking to him, and allowing our minds to be expanded in such a way as to receive the strength and the potency that we need to continue to walk as many years and days as you give us in this earthly journey. And so we look to you and to him and to it, the word, today, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we are in the midst of a series uh, in 1 Corinthians, and it seemed fitting uh, to stay in Corinthians uh, for this Sunday, even though I'm skipping ahead by a number of chapters, uh, God willing, when we get back into church next uh, Sunday, we'll resume our study in uh, the early chapters of 1 Corinthians, we'll be getting into chapter 4, uh, but it seemed fitting to stay in Corinthians and to draw from uh, the most uh, celebrated chapter in its comprehension, uh, comprehensiveness in dealing with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this uh, whole passage really is dealing with Christian hope, uh, that the Christian has a certain future hope that gives a compelling rationale for the present life. The very last verse, I'm going to read uh, that verse in our scripture reading, the last verse of this chapter, is this, therefore, of course, therefore means other verses have come before that form the premise for this conclusion, therefore, beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, a certain future hope that gives us a compelling rationale uh, for giving our lives to Him, giving our lives wholly to Him in Christian service while we have breath in our lungs. Let me put this hope in perspective by offering to you a a fictitious analogy. Uh, Two men work for the same company. They do the same menial tasks. 
They have the same job, absolutely, in every possible way. No difference whatsoever. And also the same uh, poor working conditions. Absolutely the same in every way. They come to work at the same time. They leave at the same time. Uh, they do all the various things in the same way, exactly the same. No difference whatsoever. One of them is promised $15,000 for one year of this menial labor. The other one is promised $15 million for this same menial labor. I would submit to you that uh, these two different uh, payoffs is going to make these two workers look at their work very differently. Now, both of them are working with a future goal in mind. Both of them are, are, are motivated with the impulse of gaining something for their labor. But the latter worker is in possession of a far deeper, a far more restful, a far more worry-free motive than his counterpart. Would you agree? I would submit to you that this more uh, worry-free spirit is the central currency of the resurrection. The last couple of weeks we looked at uh, 1 Corinthians 3 in which there's a couple of places in that chapter that speak of wages, that speak of compensation. It speaks of rewards. I use the language of crowns. Uh, the resurrection has everything to do with uh, that currency. It's truly amazing to think about the vibrancy of the early Christians when for the most part they had no material advantages. They had no political advantages. They had no cultural or military or educational advantages generally across the world. They were generally uh, on the lower end of the strata and yet the vibrancy of the early Christians. Uh, there was a steadfastness to the early Christians. There was a, an immovability to the early Christians. There was an always aboundingness to the early Christians. Why? Because of the resurrection. Let me read our verses uh, today. It's in your bulletin. Uh, chapter 15, beginning of verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, He also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, he worked harder than any of, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. And then skipping uh, to verse 35, but someone will ask, and this was a question they asked him, how are they did raise, and with what kind of body do they come? His response, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And we'll come back to that verse later on in our study. And then skipping ahead to verse 47. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. 
But when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, in his book uh, by Rodney Stark, um, he, he, the book is entitled The Rise of Christianity, in which he says there are at least three ways in which the early Christians were remarkably different uh, than their pagan neighbors. And what made them different? And he, these are the answers that he came up with as he surveyed the, the data. One was under the, the, uh, the issues of epidemics, so we can relate to that. When epidemics struck, it was uh, the, the non-Christian people that fled the cities to get out. It was Christians who stayed in the cities, ministering to the sick, even in some cases, some of them uh, gave up their lives to do that. When Christians were persecuted, that is, when they were put to death unjustly, they did not respond with terrorism. Christians who were under assault did not respond with guerrilla warfare. They did not respond with violent retaliation. Rather, Christians died praying for their enemies' forgiveness. Then thirdly, Rodney Stock ports out that in the height of the Roman Empire, the Roman conquered all the nations, all the nations in the Mediterranean. And because they were now all Rome, all the nations that had had borders to those nations were all removed. And so now everybody could cross throughout the Roman Empire and, and settle wherever they wanted without having to remain within their little confines. And it turned out that in the case of Roman cities, that the cities became a kind of a melting pot of ethnic diversity and also ethnic tension. And Rodney Stark observed this, that it was the Christian church that became the first institution where... Uh, that the, the people were brought together across ethnic barriers. And how did that happen? And the answer is because of the resurrection. How did all of these uh, Christians do these things? Well, it was the resurrection. When the early Christians looked to the resurrection of Jesus, they were fortified. The reality of the resurrection was a real, tangible currency. And I'm going to use the language of this currency in the form of fortifiers. And what are the fortifiers that gave Christians what they needed under these circumstances? And I have them here listed for you. Let's look at them one at a time. And then we'll have the Lord's Supper together. The first fortifier is a stingless death. Verse 55. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. What is this sting? Well, the sting is not simply a puncture or a bite that is referenced here. The word sting suggests something a little bit more potent. Uh, the word sting is poisonous sting, as in the sting of a scorpion. It is a lethal sting. It's an interesting thing about this image that it's not the sting or the bite that kills you. It's the poison in the bite that does the damage. Paul tells us what this bite is. He says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death. He used the word sting here, but it really means the poison. The poison of death is the law. Now, what is he referring to when he's talking about the sting of death or the poison of death? Well, it refers, I think, to aware an awareness, a consciousness. One of the early uh, century philosophers was someone called Epicurus. His, he lived 300 years before the apostles, and yet his philosophy was still around during the time of the apostles. Uh, there were Epicurean philosophers that Paul encountered in Acts chapter 17. So his philosophy was quite popular. His philosophy was well-liked. His philosophy was well-used, and it stayed in, in, as a part of 
what uh, intellectual elitist types would utilize to think through how to live successfully in the world during the time of the apostle. Epicurus famously said this about death. He said, death is nothing to us. When we exist, death is not. And when death exists, we are not. The fear of death arises from the belief that in death there is awareness. In other words, all sensation in death ends at death. All consciousness ends when death happens upon someone. In death, there is neither pleasure nor pain. So Epicurus said, if we could be totally sure that when we die, we, there is no more consciousness, there would be no reason to be afraid. There would be no sting. There would be no fear. For as long as we're alive, death uh, is not with us. But as soon as we die, we are extinguished. And therefore, there'd be no reason to fear. Therefore, there is no problem when we contemplate death, right? No problem. Except there is a problem. A big problem. For no one can be certain that there is no awareness after death. No one can be certain that there is no judgment after death. Because we know judgment is possible, because we know that there is, will be awareness after death, we have a reason to be afraid of death. And anyone who has ever faced death suddenly can know if you ever experienced that. All of a sudden, a sudden death experience, you might have the experience of your life flashing before your eyes. Or perhaps you see headlines and you see your name on the headlines in this momentary flash. Or when you have a near-death experience, you, you have an awakening. You realize, wow, I almost lost my life here. I really better think about getting my act together. That kind of language comes up in the minds and hearts of people when they face death suddenly, when it brushes by them and spares them. That sense of awareness. Like, life really matters more than I ever thought possible before. Well, you might say, well, I really don't believe that. And my response to you is, how can you be certain? How can you know that death, that in death there is no awareness? If you Google death and the experience of death or the fear of death, you would find a lot of people have a different, have a different feeling. They, they believe there's a reason to be afraid of death. Therapists, therapists will say that. Poets will say that. Counselors will say that. Theologians and philosophers will say that. The sting of death is sin, verse 55. The power of sin is the law. And by that, I think he's referring to the law of conscience, the law written on the human heart that arms death with a sting and therefore fear. There's a place in Shakespeare, in Hamlet, where he says, I could end it all. And then he says, but that dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from born, no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. How are we going to get rid of the sting? How are we going to get rid of the fear? Well, the answer is the resurrection. Epicurus says that we can't be sure that after death there isn't any judgment, and so we're scared. The conscience. The gospel come along, come, comes along and says, in fact, there is judgment. But it's the judgment of God on Jesus on the cross. There's that place in the Garden of Gethsemane where Peter is about to come to the defense of Jesus and he takes out a sword and, and John's gospel says that, only that, and he says, put your sword away. But we know from the other accounts in the gospels that he actually acted and, and cut somebody's ear off. Jesus went to and healed that man's ear. He said, put the sword away. And then he asked this question, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me, he said? And what is this cup? Well, the cup is the cup of death. The Father has handed me a cup, and shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink it all the way down to its dregs? In other words, shall I not drink death on the cross so that you would be saved? That's what he's saying. And how do you know that Jesus paid the penalty for us on the cross? How do you know that? Because of the resurrection. You know what the resurrection is? It's a receipt. And do you keep your receipts? You go to Home Depot and that electronic thing, and 
It asks you, do you want a receipt? Do you want a paper receipt? Do you want an electronic receipt? You want both? I put both. Okay, I always lose paper receipts. And I want to know that if I ever have to return something, that they know that I own it, that I actually did pay for it. The receipt says it's been paid for. That's why you keep your receipts. Uh, the receipt is proof. The receipt is an acknowledgement that death is stingless. That's what the resurrection is all about. What fortified the first century Christians? What enabled them to face the incredible odds against which they were, they were stacked up against? It was this, that there is a stingless death. Uh, there is no poison in death. Death will bite you, but it really cannot kill you. You might think, wait a minute, wait a minute. Death will bite you, but it can't kill you. What do you mean by that? Well, let's go to point number two. The second fortifier, the swallowed up suffering. Verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus does something to death. The resurrection of Jesus does something something to death. What does the resurrection do to death? It says there's a victory here. Death is in victory. What is that victory? That death is swallowed up. Now, of course, it's Easter, and very likely many of you uh, are, have already made preparations for a supper. Uh, there's probably something in your oven right now baking for supper, and uh, you're Probably the thinking that the main course is going to be ham, maybe, uh, turkey, maybe pizza. Uh, well, no, pizza would not be an appropriate uh, main course for Easter. So let's get rid of the pizza. How would you get rid of pizza? Well, you put it back in the refrigerator, put it in the freezer. Or you toss it, throw it away. Or maybe you would eat it. What happens when you eat something? What happens when you... Uh, uh, swallow food, does it not digest? Does it not get broken down so uh, it, your body then utilizes it for energy and for nutrition? Death is swallowed up, which mean, that means uh, death is ingested. Death is taken in. Uh, death is then taken in and then broken down and transformed. And death is transformed into something that gives nutrition, that something gives life. Some that gives vitality. Notice verse 49, if you have your Bible open. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so also we bear the image of the man of heaven. What do we know about the image of the man of heaven? What do we know about him? What do you know about Jesus in his resurrected state? If you saw Jesus in his resurrected state today, what would you see? You'd see Jesus, but you'd also see his wounds. His wounds, his wounds are still visible. His wounds are still on him. And that must mean that his sorrows remain as part of his glory. Now, what does that mean for you? I don't know what it means other than it means that the resurrection, in the resurrection, it doesn't just say that we get to go to heaven and, as a consolation for what we did not get on earth. The resurrection isn't just that you get a consolation prize. But the resurrection means that you get what you've always wanted on earth in the resurrection. Do you ever hope for a family? You get that in the resurrection. Do you ever want love? You get that in the resurrection. Do you want to belong? You get everything you ever wanted in the resurrection. I think this must mean that it means that the worst thing that you've ever experienced, I know some of you have experienced bad things. I don't know what they are, but you have. You remember them, and maybe uh, some of those bad things are things you feel very deeply even today. The resurrection means that these very terrible things are going to be transformed into a joy greater than you could possibly have imagined. The resurrection means that it is an utter defeat of suffering. The resurrection means death is swallowed up. Death is taken in. Death is digested. Death is transformed. 
your deepest sorrows, the deepest sorrows that you've ever experienced, the hardest hardships you have ever experienced, the most heartbreaking event of your entire life is going to be transformed so that you'll experience a joy greater than you could have ever imagined in the resurrection. Imagine that fortifying the church. Someone once said about Christians in the first century, them facing the lions and, and how they then prayed for the forgiveness of their captors. Well, someone then said, we don't fear lions today, but we fear lumps. Don't we? We fear that. The doctor says you have a lump. But what happens when the doctor says you have a lump? Well, they then send you to get it tested. And you go to a clinic and they take a biopsy and, and that might have taken a couple of weeks to schedule. And you get in, you, they take a lump, they take a lumpectomy and pretty soon it goes to the clinic. And then how long does it take for the results get back from, to the clinician about what it is? And then that gets given to the doctor and the doctor then three weeks later is able to schedule then to find out what exactly this is all about. And it's taken four, five, six weeks before all the while you're thinking about this thing. Do we not need to be fortified by such a great thing as the resurrection? Certainly we do. Then there's a third fortifier. And this fortifier is this wonderful, wonderful gift. This new thing that God has done for you and for me. You know, in uh, uh, chapter 15, verses 35 through 49, it starts with verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? He says, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And he has other things to say there. Verse 38 says, the bo God, bo God gives it a body uh, as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. And then verse 45, it says, uh, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. This entire 15 verses is essentially saying one thing. And it's this. Every creation has a differentiated identity. Every creation. Humans have a differentiated identity that's different than animals. Animals different than birds. Birds different than fish. Fish different than stars. Stars different than planets. Every creation has a differentiated identity. That's true of individuals as well as all the other creatures and things God has made. And then he says this. In the gift of the resurrection, the Holy Spirit has deposited into every believer a share of the differentiated identity of the last Adam. You used to be a sharer of the first Adam. The first man, Adam, became a living being. We understand that. That's what we are. We're alive. We're living beings because we are sharers in Adam. But in the resurrection and in God uniting us to Jesus in his death and resurrection, he makes us to take part in his life-giving spirit character. Before salvation, you used to be in Adam as a living being, but now in Christ you are sharers in the last Adam, life, the life-giving spirit of the resurrected Christ Jesus. And that if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, you are sharers of this. But here's the catch, and there's a catch. And the catch is this, that it, you are still in seed form. You know, I have in my notes here a picture of... Um, Perhaps the most beautiful uh, flower uh, uh, around, in my opinion. Uh, if you're a florist, uh, please don't take offense. But I think uh, among the most beautiful in vividness and starkness and brightness would be the tulip. It is gorgeously, I'm looking at uh, hues of purple and shades of purple and uh, red and blending with orange and pink and uh, uh, all these various hues, just a spectacular array of colors. Uh, but the tulip doesn't start out that way. It first starts out as a bulb. You know, every seed doesn't look anything like what the seed is going to bear. A, a strawberry seed doesn't look like a strawberry. A, you know, a, a rose doesn't look like a rose. A, you know, tomato seed doesn't look like a tomato. 
uh, but it looks very, very different. And when you look at the, 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 the seed of a tulip, a bulb, it looks very plain. It looks like a fig. It looks like an onion. It has kind of a brown husk. If you peel away the husk, you can see a white, uh, kind of a macadamia color looking uh, seed in there. And it doesn't look anything like uh, what it becomes. The tulip bulb represents our experience for Christians here in this life, this side of the resurrection. And the glorious colors and the vividness of the tulip flowers is uh, representative of what shall be uh, in the resurrection. What this is really saying is that we're all seeds, we're all pods, we're all bulbs. In Christ, you are in possession of the fundamental DNA of what shall be, but that's not where we're at now. We're in the bulb form. You know, as I get older, you look more like a bulb when you get older. Uh, a lot bulbous than I'm more bulbous than I used to be. But the, in order for the bulb to become a flower, it has to be planted. The verse 35 says, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. You must be planted. The bulb must be planted before it becomes. So it is in chapter 15, verse 42, where Paul says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. That's the bulb. Raised imperishable. That's the flower. What is sown in dishonor, and that's the bulb, is raised in glory. I don't know if I've had the occasion to be at the bedside of uh, a couple of instances uh, of somebody who has just passed away. I've often thought how it is the indignity of it, the indignity of death, where you see somebody there and you only see the shell of what that person used to be. It could have been, you know, your mother or your, or your father or a brother or sister. The person doesn't look anything like what they were. The color's gone. The facial expressions are completely warped. The indignity of death, the dishonor of it, that's this bulb thing. That's what our life is like. It was sown in weakness. Yet in the resurrection, raised in glory, raised in power, that's who you are. That's the self. That's this, this new creation in you, but it's in a seed form. It's really you the properties of it are really there. And from time to time, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we see some of the new life coming out even in the midst of bodies that are wearing down. Yes, in this earthly life, we have this bulb-like experience, this bulb-like stuff attached to us. The sins, the misunderstandings, the fears, the things that our parents pass down to us that we you know, we try and overcome more and more, but, you know, regardless of how hard you try, you're never going to get rid of all of it. And let me just say, by way of warning, your kids are going to try and get rid of all the stuff you've passed out of them, too. And we're never going to get rid of all of it until we're planted in the ground. And we're planted, we're planted in perishability, planted in dishonor, planted in weakness, only to be raised in imperishable glorious, powerful resurrection reality. That's what God has made us. That's what fortifies us. That's what enables us to face the worst kind of adversity with the knowledge uh, that we shall all live out this resurrection reality and it never to be taken away. I want to submit to you, this is absolutely bedrock truth. And I want this to fortify you. I hope it does. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege it is ours to, to contemplate the wonders of the resurrection. And now to respond to you in a most uh, beautiful way in a way in which you have prescribed for your people. Taking the cup of the Lord and the bread of the Lord, 
and meeting him because in the table he meets us. Lord, today I pray that as we have uh, contemplated the, the beauty of these uh, fortifying realities, uh, it may not actually have the occasion to settle in until we actually take some time and meditate on them. So I pray for the next few minutes that we can do just that. Take the time to meditate and remembering how it was all achieved by the death of your son. And so I pray today that your people would be able to do business with you. To find in you comfort, to find in you courage and strength. To be able to return to the fight, the fight of living out this Christian life and finish, finishing well. Lord, I commend these people to you. I commend uh, these truths to your people and pray that your spirit would make them alive in our hearts even today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, it's a privilege to be able to respond to uh, the Lord uh, by taking the Lord's Supper. And because we are in Corinthians, I'm going to read to you the verses from uh, 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which, in which he was betrayed, took bread, and he broke it. Broke it in half and gave it to his disciples. And then he also, after supper, took the cup. And this cup resembles the cup that was distributed to his disciples on that evening. Tonight we have the occasion to respond by taking the prescribed method for this uh, observance of bread and a cup and uh, receive the Lord. You know, as I've had the occasion to, to teach our catechism uh, classes for children, you know, of course, the, the bread represents his uh, body, the cup represents his blood, and the eating and the drinking represents our faith once again. And so it's our, our, our privilege now to trust in him, to trust in the word that is vested in these elements. And I want to just uh, uh, remind you that this is for Christians. And that this is not for those who have not placed their faith in Jesus. But if you have placed your own faith in Jesus, trusted Him for your righteousness. Trusted Him for your forgiveness. And if you have joined yourself to a, a gospel Bible-believing church, then when these elements come by in a few minutes, then I want you to take one of these little elements and, uh, and then we'll partake together. But if it does that, that does not apply to you, then when these elements come by, please do not partake. Let me pray and set these elements aside. Thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have to observe the Supper of the Lord. And would you be pleased to impress your resurrection truth upon uh, this sacrament wherein we are remembering the death of Jesus in our place. And we give thanks for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the elements will be distributed to you when they are all, uh, we'll hold on to them and then we'll partake together.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. If you haven't already, why don't you go and peel the cellophane back and get your little wafer. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that from all eternity you had planned to rescue us. For God commended his own love toward us in that while where we had sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you that we are no longer of the first Adam, but are now made partakers of the last Adam. That in Jesus we have the deposit. We have not only the Holy Spirit who is our guarantor, but we have a a new nature, a new self. And we thank you that, indeed, even while our old man is uh, wearing away, the new man is being renewed day by day. And I pray, our Father, that as we are reminded of that, that our later years as believers would become all the sweeter, that we would start to resemble more and more the sweetness of grace, the gentleness of grace the forbearingness of grace, the restfulness with the knowledge that our labors shall be ending soon and then the multi-million dollar reward will be given to us, not for anything that we have done, although it is your grace, gracious determination to reward us. It's astounding. Uh, the infinite bounty shall be ours which belongs to your Son. Lord, I pray that we can grow more and more trustful of what you intend to do, not only with us, but also with the world. We're thankful that indeed we can begin to taste it, not only in the resurrection, but also in the Lord's Supper. And therefore, would you prosper us as we continue to put our hope and trust in you, even as we have today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we depart uh, today, may you leave being fortified in the knowledge and holding fast to this knowledge, the, the, the glorious hope of Christ and the power of his resurrection in your life. We're going to sing, Jesus Christ is risen today. We'll, of course, sing Alleluia, which is praise the Lord. Let's do so together. Please stand as we close. Christ is his today. Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day. Alleluia. Who did once upon the cross. Oh.
risen. He is risen indeed. To that end, receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today. Amen.